Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Dan Wickline Show, coming to you live from rainy and windy Los Angeles. How often do you get to say that, right? Yeah, it is uh, quite storming around here. Not so much that I'm worried about the power is going to go out or I'm going to lose my signal, but the wind has been whipping up since late last night. And outside my bedroom window, we have a canopy. I'm going to rephrase that. We had a canopy. Um, and the wind did such a number on it that now we just have the frame and tatters. Uh, there's also one outside of my office window that is currently being held down by a uh, patio umbrella. So it's... It's pretty interesting out here right now. And of course, if you've never been to California and uh, in one of the five days that it rains during the year, you will learn that uh, very few people in California actually know how to drive in the rain. And I'm not saying it's that different, but you would think that suddenly it was the floor is on fire type of thing or floor is lava. Nobody seems to know how to drive. Now, luckily, I drive a big Ford F-150 Raptor. It's extra wide, handles amazing in all bad weather. I've driven through snow. I've driven through rain. So I'm not too worried about it. But a lot of these people in California who just don't, who aren't used to the rain, they get out there and uh, that first rain comes in a long time and all the oil and stuff and gunk on the roads lift up and they make everything slippery, and you just get accident after accident after accident because nobody bothers to slow down. Nobody bothers to think, I should be a little more cautious because there's water falling from the sky. No, nope, doesn't hit them. You go to, like, Oregon or Washington, and it starts to rain, and it doesn't even phase people. Here we get uh, every uh, news reporter gets sent out to the nearest puddle to do a live report from the from the madness, it's it's really weird. So, um, yeah, that's what's going on here in LA. Uh, the other thing going on is, of course, uh, last night was the world premiere of Spider Man No Way Home. Now, they lifted the review embargo three hours after the film, which I thought was rather interesting. That meant if you were one of the reporters who got to go see it, you had to go see it and then go write your review because you don't want to be the last one to put your review up. You want it up as soon as possible. And yeah, so you pretty much didn't get to hang out, didn't get to do the party stuff. You had to do your uh, watch the movie, then do your review and uh, hope hope it's good to go. Also, these, a lot of the reviewers are dancing around trying to avoid spoilers, but from what I understand about this movie, it's really hard to talk about without talking about spoilers because there's a ton of surprises and things going on in this film. Now, if you were a little worried that maybe there's too much going on, that it's just completely bonkers, the majority of reviews I've seen have been consistent. They think that it's great fan service mixed in with a lot of heart and a good story, and it's a good MCU thing. Uh, some people are calling it the best MCU film yet. Um, but the, the, the big criticism about it is that the first half is kind of bloated. There's a lot of characters and stuff to deal with. But the second half or the third act more than makes up for it making it a really strong movie. So the reviews have been absolutely positive on it. Uh, Rotten Tomato, which, of course, uh, pulls together all the different reviews, they have 74 reviews as of right now. Well, let me double check. Yep, still 74. And it's getting a 97% fresh. That is phenomenal. I went through a little while ago, and I found, like, two negative reviews. Uh, one from uh, a site called Now Toronto. So uh, obviously he hates things in the world, but 
Yeah, it's getting some really, really good reviews, really good word of mouth. And there's not a lot of spoilers out there yet. Um, I've heard a couple just little things, and it's not like I ran into them. I almost had to seek them out. Was one of them from me? You, not that I'm aware of. Uh, well, that is the one thing that people are also consistently saying is that Tom Holland is fantastic in this. That he really brings it home and, and, and gets, you know, nails the character even better than before. So I think uh, it sounds like people should be excited to go see this. And that, uh, oh, but the one thing I can tell you, because it's not really a spoiler, the uh, trailer for Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness is attached to the end of the movie. So one of the post credit scenes is the trailer for the Doctor Strange movie. So I don't know when they'll release it to the general populace, general public, but right now it's, uh, you know, you want to see it, you have to go see the movie. Sorry, I had missed, uh, I had missed Kyle's uh, posts. I had the thing set on wrong. So I've got chat up now. So I, if anybody posts in there, I will see it. But I am greatly looking forward to Spider-Man, just as I am greatly looking forward to episode five of Hawkeye, because this is the one that folks are saying is going to have the big reveals, a big cameo. Uh, TV line specifically said uh, the guy over TV line said that um, episode five will have the cameo that breaks Twitter. I, I think we all kind of have a feeling what that's going to be. You know, it's pretty straightforward, but then again, we got a, uh, Evan Peters in uh, WandaVision, and he didn't. He turned out not to be Quicksilver. Turned turned out to be a guy named Boner. So, moderate your expectations. Yeah, remember, speculating is fun and great, but at some point. What you've also got to judge and enjoy them, the shows and the movies for what they present, not for what you wished was in there. So, if you go to Spider Man this weekend and you get all the stuff you would hope for, we're going to be in it. Terrific. If something isn't in it, still try to enjoy the movie for what it is. Tonight on, on a Hawkeye, I say tonight because LA, it drops at midnight. I'm sitting down at late Tuesday night to watch it. But if tonight or tomorrow you see uh, Hawkeye and the cameo isn't who you expected it to be, you know, it's not uh, Samuel L. Jackson coming in going, what are you two doing? It, you know, nothing like that. Well, then don't be upset. Enjoy the show for what it is. But if it is that cameo you've been expecting, terrific. Consider it a Christmas gift. All right, guys, let's go ahead and, uh, oh, by the way, tomorrow uh, I am going to do a primer on Spider-Man to get everybody ready for the movie, remind you guys of what, what characters we do know, what backstories you need for them. You know, we, do, we know we get five of the villains from the Sam Raimi and Mark Webb movies. Um, those, are, those are all confirmed things. I, I may talk about the rumors, but I won't. If I hear any spoilers, I won't actually give any spoilers on the show tomorrow. And then on Thursday, we will do a deep breakdown of the new episode of Hawkeye, Hawkeye Episode 5. So you'll want to join me here for that. All right. Today, we are going to talk about Jack. Now... One of the breakout characters from Hawkeye is definitely Tony Dalton playing Jack Duquesne. Um, 
what we've seen of the character over the last four episodes has shown him to be either a somewhat charming, eccentric buffoon or a clever killer that is tied to money laundering and the tracksuit mafia. It's a pretty interesting dichotomy there, isn't it? When are we talking about the Christmas season's most important film, The Matrix? What is it about The Matrix you want to talk about? Oh, it's not Spider-Man. You're not really loving the whole uh, Spider-Man thing, are you? Nope. Okay. Uh, Roy Brenneman says, opinions on Joe. I don't get that one. What am I missing? Joe. Kyle, you got anything on that? No, but I'm going to play the spoiler warning. Okay, go for it. Feel like we need it. I don't know that we actually do, but I feel like we need it. Yeah, it's good to have it up. It'll just raise the energy in the room. Oh, definitely. Barrel roll. All right. Here we go. All right. So we are talking about Jack Duquesne. And uh, let's see. Where was I in my notes? Uh, so it's a pretty interesting dichotomy, as the show is seriously pointed at Jack as a bad guy. You know, he steals Ronan's sword from the auction. Kate believes he's suspect. He's in an argument with Armand III, who's played by Simon Callow. And then Armand is killed in his own home with a sword. Oh, and then there's those monogram butterscotch candies that Kate sees at Armand's. And then later, she's offered one by Jack. Again, circumstantial, but kind of pointed in his direction. But, but Jack is also the guy that mixes up his aphorisms, is a bit of an over-top romantic, and genuinely seems to want to be a good stepfather, even though he's going about it the wrong way. You know, I bought a book. Now, the writers put this giant arrow on him, no pun intended being that this is an archery show, but since the very beginning, and, and now we have to decide whether whether we believe he's a bad guy or not, or if he's just a patsy, you know? Well, maybe we can get a clue about what the character is going, where, where this character is going based on his comic book counterpart. This is, this is an old school Marvel character. I mean, this was created by Stan Lee and Don Heck in the pages of Avengers number 19, all the way back in June of 1965. Uh, in the comics, he was given the name Jacques Duquesne, not just Jack, Jacques. Um, and he, he's also got this colorful alias in costume going by the Swordsman. So we've not called him the Swordsman here. We just, the guy who's got a sword addiction, the Sword Addict may be a better name for Jack. But in the comics, he's the Swordsman. And he was a circus performer who was partnered with another archer named Trickshot for their act. Uh, one day when they Jack or Jacques met um, a young man named Clint Barton, who he saw some great potential in. So he takes the boy in and he, uh, he and Trickshot train Clint in blades and archery. So Clint is actually um, a good swordsman. That's why when he's Ronan, he's using the sword. He's a well-trained swordsman as well. Um, eventually, though, Clint joins the act and becomes like another part of it. So there's two archers, and but um, Jack's got a Jacques's got a bit of a gambling problem, and he's in heavy debt. So he decides to ro rob the carnival paymaster, and Clint finds out. Well. When Clint finds out, he tries to run away, and Jacques gives chase. It ends up in the big top, uh, 
He climbs up the, the ladder and tries to escape across the tightrope, which just seems like a really bad because you could just climb back down, go to the other side, or, you know. But, and of course, Jock, Jock just cut the rope. Clint fell and hurt himself, and Jacques believed he was dead and just left him for dead. Clint, of course, survived and went on to become Hawkeye. Now, got a little side note here for you. There are two different people in the Marvel comics who have used the name Trickshot. The first was Buck Chisholm, who's the one who trained Clint. The second is Barney Barton, Clint's older brother, and is introduced in a slight revamping of Hawkeye's origin. But that doesn't really seem to apply here, so we're going to keep moving. Just wanted to mention it. In case you decided you want to look up Trickshot and ended up with Barney instead of Buck, because that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. Well, what do you mean he was trained by his brother, and did he not know it was his brother? Yeah. So he wasn't trained by his brother. They just His brother ended up taking the same name. Now, Jacques continued on in a life of crime for a while, then came up with the idea that he could maybe line up better crimes if he was an Avenger. Not sure how that logic works. I'm going to go hang out with a big group of superheroes so that I can do better crimes. Anyway, he offers to join, and they refuse. And Jacques gets a little upset, and he attacks Captain America. Well, the, this is the Avengers, so they all come to help Cap. So he's surrounded by Avengers about to get his butt kicked when suddenly he's teleported away by the Mandarin. Yes, the Mandarin who uh, has plans for the swordsman. He's going to use him as a double agent against Iron Man. Now, what the Mandarin does, is he takes Jacques' sword and he tricks it out in kind of the same way that the original Ten Rings were done in the comics. They're McLuhan technology. McLuhan's are the big dragon-like creatures. I think Fing Fang Foom is a McLuhan. So he, he's got some of the powers of the rings as his sword now, which is cool. And then the Mandarin sends a fake message from Iron Man to the Avengers, asking them to accept swordsmen onto the team. Now, they're pretty suspect at this point and think it's a trap. But they go for it anyway. Yeah, sure, you can come on the team. We're going to be watching you, but you can come on the team. Now, while the character now has ties here to the Mandarin in comics, I doubt there will be a connection to Shang-Chi's father in the MCU. Unless he turns out to be a sleeper agent for the Ten Rings. I haven't seen any stray tattoos on him or anything, though. Let's, uh, yeah, let's keep that as an unlikely but possible pile. You know, we'll keep that over there, the possible. Just not probable. All right. Let's see, what else we got on Jack here? Well, while as part of the Avengers, the swordsman actually fit him pretty well. Uh, he, he adventured with them, and uh, he started to form a crush on the Scarlet Witch. When the Mandarin ordered him to lure the Avengers into an explosive trap, Jacques was worried Wanda would get hurt, and he tried to disarm the bomb. When the Avengers arrived, though, they saw Jack messing with this bomb and seeing that it was a trap and assumed he was setting the trap. Now, Jacques, of course, couldn't explain his way out of it, so he ran, and he regretted it. Because he, at that point, he actually longed to be an Avenger. He really wanted to be an Avenger. But, you know, he ended up turning back to a life of crime. And also began heavy drinking. He was, he was depressed, you know, and uh, he missed out on Wanda. Sad. Now, somehow in the middle of all this, there was an adventure which had him in it, aiding the Avengers in an, in Asgard in a battle against Ares and the Enchantress. But he only stepped back onto the team for that. And he went back right back to crime and working for a guy named Monsieur Krull. Now, so Jack has ties to Wanda in the comics. 
Maybe we'll see a connection between him and the MCU version, who has now definitely gone much darker path. If she were to put together a Masters of Evil type team, Swordsman could be a good fit. Again, possible, but not really probable, I would think. All right, well, while working for Krull, uh, Jacques meets Mantis, who is working as a barmaid. She tried to convince Jacques that he could once again be a hero, but it wasn't until he was injured on an assignment and Mantis nursed him back to health that he started to believe he could be a hero again. Uh, the two ended up sneaking away, heading to the United States, where Jacques once again asked to join the Avengers. Now, he had such sincerity to him in his request that it actually won the Avengers over, and he was allowed back in. Uh, also, Mantis was there, and he fell in love with Mantis, but she didn't uh, reciprocate the feelings. Now, I know some of you may only, your only experience may be with Mantis from the com uh, from the movies. Uh, here, she's just a human. She's, well, there's a lot more to her, but she starts off as a human, and there's ties together. Now, now, with Jock having a connection to Mantis from Guardians of the Galaxy, though, I find this interesting. I'm fairly sure the first and only time Mantis has the MCU Mantis has been on Earth, though, was during the battle for Thanos. So they're very different characters. It would be hard to connect the two characters at this point. Not that they couldn't end up having like a quick scene together, but then again, what happens next makes things even more interesting. The next thing it turns out is that Mantis was actually the Celestial Madonna. And Kang the Conqueror set out to make her his bride. Now, it took the Avengers and another version of uh, Kang named Rama Tut to stop his mad plan. Now, being a bit of a sore loser, Kang decided that if he couldn't have her, no one would, and fired a ray beam at her. Now, Swordsman leapt in front of her, taking the shot which fatally wounded him. Mantis, of course, realized as Jacques was dying that she did actually love him. They buried his body in a garden near where Mantis had grown up. So now we have a connection to Kang the Conqueror. For a character who really hasn't been used a lot, Jacques Duquesne seems to have had run-ins with most of the big characters in MCU's Phase 4. You know, if only he wasn't dead in the comics. Oh, wait, dead is never really dead in the comics, is it? Yeah. Yeah, there's still more history to Jacques, even even though he was dead. Dead just doesn't do it in comics. So what happens to Jacques next? Well, the garden he was buried in was maintained by the priests of Pama, and it contained the sentient plants known as the Kotati. And it turns out the eldest tree, the prime Kotati, was the one actually destined to mate with Mantis. That Kotati decided to inhabit Jacques' body, raises it from the grave, and approaches Mantis, explaining everything to her. Now, you have to be an amazing salesman if you can convince someone that you're an ancient sentient tree inhabiting a girl's dead, dead boyfriend's body, and that the two of you should mate. That takes skill. Now, she buys the story. And their marriage is officiated by a mortis, yet another version of Kang. And then the two turned into energy and left Earth. You had me an ancient sentient tree. <laughs> so they turned into energy, they leave Earth. There was no reception, no dancing, no cake. The beast was very upset. He wanted cake. Now, it was later revealed that their spirits had left their bodies behind so they could procreate. I don't know about you guys, but I was fairly sure that bodies were an important part of procreating. Just saying. All right, so... Bowchikoa. <laughs> I'm just, just science, you know, but it's celestial Madonnas and stuff, so I don't know. Anyway... They, they rebury, once they left, they reburied the swordsman's body or Jack's body, Jacques' body. 
But they also buried Mantis's body, which she wasn't actually dead. She was in kind of this state of suspended animation. Now, they could have just put her on a nice bed like Sleeping Beauty, but no, they just toss her in the ground, throw dirt on her. That seems kind of disrespectful, especially for the Celestial Madonna, doesn't it? Now, if you think it ends here, you'd be wrong. Mantis would later approach the West Coast Avengers, seeing their help, seeking their help, excuse me, as she has no memory of what happened to her since she left Earth. Now, this led her and the team to the temple of the priest of Palma, where Jacques' body springs back to life again, once more possessed by the prime Kotati. In the swordsman's body, the Kotati attacked and killed Mantis, which forced her spirit to leave the body, which turned out to be just a plant silicrum. And her spirit then returned to her actual body that was, about, that was buried not far away. She then dug herself out of the ground. Again, had they just put her on a table, right? A bed, a table, a little, you know, she's not very big, maybe an ottoman or something. Has that been? No, they had a barrier. Anyway, so she digs herself out of the ground and was able to remember what happened to her. And then the prime Kotati, having completed his task, leaves Jack's body to collapse back to the ground. And this time, it disintegrates. They don't even bury it again. It just disintegrates. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's got to be the end, right? The body is disintegrated. Nothing else you can do. This has to be the end, right? No more Jock to gain. Turns out, no. There was an event called Chaos War, and the swordsman was resurrected by Chaos King, and he fought against the Grim Reaper, alongside the other dead Avengers. Not sure how he had just, you know, he had just been dust, and then he's back again, and then when the battle was over, he perished again. Just, overall, Jacques didn't really have a great life from the moment he tried to kill Clint on. Man, karma's a bitch, isn't it? Now, if you're curious what tricks the Mandarin put in Jacques' sword, they're similar to some of the original Ten Rings from the comics. He could project energy beams with concussion blasts. Uh, he had a disintegration ray. A large jet of flame he could shoot. It's a big burst of flame. He could do electrical blasts, and he could stream knockout gas all from the sword. And there was different, like, gems on there. Very similar to the way uh, the Mandarin's original Ten Rings work. Now, that's the comic history. Well, that's a lot of crazy stuff to happen for one character who made maybe 80 appearances total in his comic life since 1965. But he's got connections, connections to Hawkeye, the Avengers, Scarlet Witch, the Mandarin, Kang, and Mantis. But at the end of the day, there's a good chance that, the, that he's only a supporting character in the series who we may never see again in the MCU. That's the thing you have to remember about Marvel versus Marvel Studios. They have thousands of characters at their disposal with decades of history. And even now with them doing like five series and four movies a year, they can still only get to so many of these characters. Some of them just aren't going to get their moment to shine. Others being, you know, other than being the person to train Clint, he isn't really a pivotal to any of the big stories that Marvel Studios may want to tell. If they decided to do the Celestial Madonna story with Mantis, they would likely do that in space and just choose a different host for the prime Kotati. You know, the swordsman not really an integral part of that. Sadly, the comic version of the swordsman has had some interesting stories, but none that, that I can see them rushing to get onto the big screen. All right, guys, let's take a quick break here, and we'll talk a little bit more about Jacques Duquesne or Jack Duquesne when we get back. See you in a minute.
There's something for every imagination at your local comic shop. Visit ComicShopLocator.com to find a store near you. Welcome back to the Dan Wickline Show. Today we are talking about Jacques Duquesne, Jack Duquesne from the Hawkeye series played by Tony Dalton. Before we get back into the discussion, though, let me remind you, coming up right after this is going to be Black Comic Universe. With uh, Today they're doing the pros and cons of cons, number two, with Jamar Nicholas. Following that will be Minute to Skim It with Miss Jen as they go through some of the books coming out this week. And then at 5 o'clock Pacific, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, will be myself and producer Kyle as we cover the books in stores this week. And we've got, oh, and even a dozen or more, more than a dozen at this point, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 13. 13 titles we're looking at, and I've read 12 and a half of them. So by then I'll have read all 13. Did but you get we're the gonna one cover... I sent you late in the day? Uh, yes. Okay. That was a lot of comic street this week. Yes, it was. All right. Did you read them all? No. <laughs> but I've read most of them. Okay. I think, I read, books... I think I read 10 of 12, and I'm my goal is to get to the other two uh, before the show starts. So we'll see. Okay. Well, some of the books we're going to cover tonight, Cloaked, number one from Dark Horse, written by Mike Richardson. There's uh, the latest Exo Man of War, the new Vampirella Dracula Unholy, number one by Christopher Priest, uh, Sheena, volume, uh, Sheena, Queen of the Jungle, number two, a new Robin Hood from Zenoscope. Uh, we're going to continue on with re regarding Oswald's body, the second issue of that, and uh, some other fun stuff. Some Doctor Who, Bountiful Garden, and some Edgar Allan Poe. Should be pretty interesting, so you'll definitely want to tune in for that as Kyle and I kind of go off on a rant about the latest comic books. All right, so let's get back into Jack Duquesne. Now, he could absolutely, going back to the Jack instead of Jock, Jack. He could absolutely be the bad guy. There is a possibility that he could be the one wearing the Ronin suit when Maya's father's killed. That would make a lot of sense for this type of story, as you don't really want to turn one of your leads into a pseudo-murderer in a Christmas story. And Marvel and Kevin Feige are hoping this becomes one of those Christmas traditions for people. You know, oh, it's Christmas time. What should we, oh, we need to watch Hawkeye again. You know, they, they want that to go up there with Die Hard and um, A Christmas Story and Christmas Vacation. They want that to become a normal trend. So I think they're going to stick closer to the classic Christmas format. And having the title character uh, come across as a murderer not really in the mode of a Christmas story. You don't see that at the ending of Hallmark Christmas movies. You know, oh, they fell in love when they went back to this small town, but but he murdered the mayor, so they had to take him away. No, that's not. Trust me, I pitched a couple of those movies, and they, they don't like those kind of things. Now, even though what if, if, if it was him as Ronan taking on the tracksuit mafia, 
even if that's justifiable, Hawkeye is still a hero to the audience. So you can do that and say, oh, he's trying to get over it, and you're following that character. But when you introduce Maya and you see the pain and the anguish that she's going through about losing her father, and we also get those scenes where we see what a loving father William really was, how connected he was to his daughter, you, you taint that killing. It really does come across like you know it, it it paints Clint with a bad brush, and right now we're cheering for him. We're it, it's kind of like John Wick. John Wick works because it's so pure of heart. John Wick is a murderer. Is an assassin. He's a killer. He's probably killed more people before the movies and he's killed in the movies and he's killed a lot of people in the movies. You know, he's named Baba Yaga for a reason, but they've given you such a pure thing in that these guys killed his dog, the dog that his dying dead wife gave him as her last thing. And now he's getting revenge. That is so pure emotionally that we all can sympathize with it. This series is Clint trying to clean up his past so he can get home to his family for Christmas. If he doesn't make it, or if that is tainted, if suddenly we go, well, why would he kill William? William was a nice guy. Shouldn't he, shouldn't he have found out that William had a daughter that needed him? Or, you know, as soon as those thoughts start happening, the emotional connection is no longer pure. So it's got to be, I mean, there really needs to be a flip there. And then you've also got Maya in the comics she discovers that it wasn't Daredevil that killed her father. It was Wilson Fisk who had raised her. Well, when she found that out, she ended up going after Fisk. And I have a feeling that that will likely be what the Echo story is. So at some point, we have to find out that Uncle, we still don't know who Uncle is, but I, I think we're all at about 90 95% that it's going to be Vincent D'Onofrio as the kingpin. But um, if she doesn't flip, then, then ha it seems really weird to have her leading her own series. You know, you don't, even uh, the Punisher, yes, he's an anti-hero, but they gave him motivation and you were rooting for him. So I think that flip still needs to happen. And I don't think it can happen if Hawkeye, if Clint is the one that killed William. I think it needs to be somebody specifically ordered by Wilson Fisk. And Jack makes a very likely candidate for some that. He would have the training to do those moves, to jump around and stuff. And as I said previously, both Jack and Clint are left-handed, and the Ronin we see attacking the tracksuit mafia is left-handed. So that kind of narrows it down a little bit, too. Um, I mean, they could absolutely make it somebody else. Um, I, I think if they took it outside of, you know, if, if it's not somebody we've already met, then it's getting a little convoluted. They, they could probably pull off saying, oh, it's Bullseye. You know, because Bullseye is so attached to uh, Fisk, and we did meet a Bullseye in the other series. So if they got that same actor, you could they could probably get away with it. Because we've got that background. Even for some people who haven't seen Daredevil, you know, that could, the background is there. But other than him, I think it pretty much has to be somebody we've already met in the show. And in my mind, that only gives you, besides Clint, three possibilities. Uh, Derek Bishop, who I'm really just at a point where I think he's just dead. I don't think there's anything to his death. I think we just didn't see it because we'll find out Eleanor killed him. 
It could be Jack. He's got the training. He makes a lot of sense. Or it could be Kazi trying to work his way up through the, uh, you know, in the ranks. So those are the only three characters I think it could be other than Clint that have been introduced in the show. And I don't think other than Bullseye they could go outside of the show. So that's just my thinking on that. Now, Jack could be working for the Kingpin. Killing William and the rest could have been the way he became CEO of Sloan Limited. Sloan Limited. It would also explain why he wanted the Ronin Sword, because he's either used it once before, or he used a facsimile of it, and now he wants the original. That said, I have a hard time believing that Jack killed Armand. It's too easy. They, it, it, it's just immediately they pointed at him, and rarely in a mystery is it ever the first suspect. Occasionally it is, but rarely. Now, that said, I also have a hard time believing that Jack... Uh, I have a hard time believing that Jack is fully aware of everything that's going on. I kind of feel like Eleanor is playing him. That there's a chance that Jack doesn't even know he's CEO of Sloan Limited. It could just be on the paper that El and Eleanor is using the company to launder stuff. Um, and, and Eleanor, who Armand threatened earlier the same night, I could see her using the sword. That way, if anybody does suspect, the, they'll cast suspicions on Jack rather than herself. She could be with him to make him a patsy. You know, I wonder if Jack, like I said, I wonder if Jack is even aware that he's CEO of Lo Sloan Limited or if Eleanor just gave him the title as more of a possible scapegoat. You know, money laundering? I am shocked. No, I I don't look that closely into the company as you, you know. It could all just be a setup. So keep that in mind. I feel like they could go a few different directions here. Jack could be a naive guy being manipulated by the woman he loves. He could be an assassin for Fisk or working with him to get close to Eleanor. She is so suspicious. Um, he could be an under undercover agent trying to bring down Bishop security and or Fisk, you know, uh, which means he could still have a past connection with Clint, but they're both good enough to hide it when they are around others. We're, we're two thirds away through this series and Tony Dalton has played Jack as kind of the perfect wild card. We get three episodes of him being suspect, and then one where he just seems like a nice, sweet guy who's in love. Which is it? Could it be a combination of things. Maybe the, the Rolex shows his real identity. Maybe he's completely innocent of the murder, but is one who is the one who attacked William. Will he ever be called the swordsman in the series? Will we get a fight between him and Clint? So many unanswered questions. I don't, I don't think any of us truly know Jack yet. Uh, Kyle says he's an Avenger, but he doesn't know it because his mustache hasn't come in fully yet. The swordsman has a dope mustache. He does have a very dope mustache. And, um, yeah, I, I think tonight's going to be very interesting. I have a feeling... We're going to get more answers tonight and set up a big finale, you know, and that's kind of what Marvel likes to do is they'll kind of do the reveals in the fifth episode. And uh, by the way, keep an eye out for a post credit scene. That's what they do in the Marvel series so far. Each of the penultimate episodes have had a post credit scene. It, the, WandaVision had it uh, with the unveiling of the White Vision. Uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier had it, I believe. Can't remember what it was at the moment. Um, what If had it with uh, uh, the Watcher going to talk to the, the uh, Strange Supreme. Loki had it with the introduction of the other Loki. So it's a normal thing for them to do a post credit scene on the fifth episode or the penultimate episode. 
it was the eighth episode on WandaVision and uh, What If. So make sure you stay through the credits tonight. But And then there's the talk about the cameo that's supposed to break the internet. So I think we're going to end up with a lot of answers tonight, but not resolution. I think the sixth episode will be the resolution. So there's a lot going on there. And, you know, you, you, yeah, you, you want to be there for it. So tune in tonight for that. Um, I mean, you know, after the last episode, Kate and Clint will end up working together again. Um, it's just, it's just the way those things work. There's always that falling out. I had expected it already, but I expected it to come when Yelena showed up and Yelena basically blew Clint's cover as Ronan that Kate would step away, but they ended up doing the opposite way. Yelena's dangerous enough, but I think we'll get better, better feel for why Yelena's there. I don't necessarily think she is there to kill Clint. I think she's sent there to kill Clint, but I think she's got her own agenda because everything she did in that fight was non-lethal. It's like she turned down her tasers on the, on the widow's sting. And when she threw Kate off the building, she secured her first so she wouldn't fall. Yeah. It, it like I said, it just seems like she was going in non-lethal. Like she wanted to, to talk but I don't know why she just didn't walk up, you know. Maybe when you're that long in the spy game, just walking up and talking to somebody doesn't seem right. I don't know. All right. That's what I've got on Hawkeye, but I've still got about seven minutes. So, Kyle, you there? Yeah, what's up? All right. So I was just thinking we could make a few suggestions for uh, uh, late-minute holiday nerd gifts. Uh, gift certificates to your local comic book shop. Gift certificates to local comic book shops are a great idea. Absolutely. Also, uh, there's a few really good movies that have come out recently on Blu-ray or DVD for people who still – and a lot of nerds still collect media. So if you are into martial arts, this is, I mean, seriously, these all came out recently. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Fantastic movie. The new Mortal Kombat. Pretty good movie. I enjoyed it. And the one I haven't watched yet, but I now have, Snake Eyes. So you got three martial arts movies there from major franchises that you could pick up if you're looking for a last-minute gift. Another thing that I came across recently and I think I'm a big fan of now. And, uh, and I love when the dust off of it. <laughs> my, my room is very dusty. It, it dust gets on everything. Um, IDW does these amazing books where they take the original art and reshoot it yep. and publish it, but they're expensive. Mm -hmm. They're very expensive the artist edition. So what they've started doing is making these smaller softback copies Yep. called uh, artisan editions. And this one here is Jack Kirby's Fantastic Four, which is probably some of the most seminal work in Marvel history. You know, I mean, this is what made the Marvel universe work. You know, uh, Jack's art, Stan's writing, uh, uh, the story of the first family of comics. I mean, this this is fantastic. There's a few of them out there. There's one for uh, Walt Simonson, I believe. There's a couple others out there. I'm still just starting to get into these, but I got this one, and they're not really that expensive. All of these gifts are going to be between like twenty and thirty dollars. Uh, you could probably pick these up at your local comic shop, but gift certificates for your local comic shops are great too. As thing, and if you uh, are looking for your local comic shop because you don't know where it is, then you can go to comicshoplocator.com, put in your zip code, 
and Bob's your uncle, they'll tell you where the nearest comic shops are to you. And they won't just give you one. They'll give you a list. So you can go, oh, I'm going to Aunt Mabel's over in this area. I could go to that shop. Or, hey, that's over by my work. I could just check in there. Or, yep. hey, that's yep. that really cool restaurant. I'm going to stop there, and then I'll get some books for him. So something to keep in mind when you're uh, looking to do that last-minute uh, shopping, because we're getting really close to Christmas. So mm -hmm. getting things sent to you, it's getting a little dodgy. Right. The, well, the experienced production team is collecting small rectangular pieces of paper with green printing on them and pictures of dead presidents. Um, we we like, like those. Um, that's a good gift for anyone. I hear they're individually numbered, too. They are. Um, Great you collector's know, items. You can trade them in for other things like yeah. food and shelter, um, <laughs> which is, a, a you know, a thing. Um, no, I, you know what I ask for this year for Christmas, Dan? Um, What's that? And it's a ridiculous uh, Duluth Trading Company gift certificates. Okay. Um, I get I every year I get gift certificates in my local comic shop. I get, you know, gift certificates that I use to go see the movies when they come out. Like I'll get several Cinemark or AMC gift certificates so I can go see these movies when they come out. Uh, it's probably the only way I'll go see Spider Man. I've got a discount code so I can get my ticket for four dollars. And I have a gift certificate, so it doesn't cost me any actual money to go yeah. see this movie I couldn't care less about. Um, but um, Duluth Trading Company, because when you get to be a guy the size of Dan or I, um, having the jeans and the clothes that are built for you is expensive, but worth it when you can get them. So that's that was my, that was my big thing, is something uh, they have... Um, at Duluth, they have jeans and overshirts, but at the local DXL, they have a bunch of licensed Marvel and DC shirts. So I'm going to get those as well. Yeah. Yeah, those are pretty cool. I've got some of them. I probably should wear them more for the show, but just seem kind of nerdy. I don't know. Yeah. A little as, I sit here with, as I sit uh, here with an action figure next yeah. to me. Right. I mean, if, you, if you're looking to, to go deep for people... Uh, Dan has an impressive collection of them, uh, sideshow figures and hot toy figures. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking to go deep on on your prices, yeah, um, those are. But, but if you if you order one that's in stock, you, they don't have. I mean, you could tell me, oh, I got you this one. It'll be here when they ship. But they have a lot of them in stock, mm -hmm. and these guys ship quickly. Yes, they do. I have actually ordered one that was in stock and had it arrive the next day. Yeah, they, they do a really good job there of getting stuff out on time. Uh, but I was also going to uh, recommend the Mezco line of figures, the 112s. Mm -hmm. And Mezco does some great things that are a little more cost effective. Yeah. And again, you're able to find them more, more readily at your local comic shop. Um, as my timer goes off to remind me that I have to get ready for the next show. Um, but no, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of great opportunities this holiday season, especially you don't know what to get somebody buy them a ticket for the stupid Spider-Man movie or buy them a ticket for the matrix or, you know, that's, a, it's a, not a terribly expensive gift. It's easy to get, mm -hmm. you know, and it's something that movies are expensive. They're a, they're a luxury that people aren't partaking in right now because of the pandemic but maybe force their hand a little. Buy a ticket. If you're looking for something for your mom, send her to West Side Story. I'm going to see West Side Story. Yeah. yeah. Would your mom I not? Seen, I will have seen West Side Story and The Matrix and Ghostbusters seven times before I will have seen Spider-Man ever. What is wrong with you? Who hurt you? Um... I guess whoever directed the first Andrew Garfield Spider-Man. Mark Webb. So, Mark Webb and then Sony as a whole. That's why I'm an Xbox guy. <laughs> I, think, I think I just have a brand preference for not Sony. But what about the rumors that Tobey Maguire might be in the movie? Is he the star? Was it directed Actually, by Sam Raimi? 
No, but Doctor Strange is good. But you would get you get a clip, you get a trailer for the next Sam Raimi movie at the end of it. Does the 2000s year it comes out in start with a zero? No, well, then I'm out. You're a very bitter man. When it comes to this particular one, I am vengeful, vindictive, bitter. I, yeah. I can't wait till you see it. Just because I, 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 I want, I, I need to see it, but I want to know your reaction to it. So. All right, guys, we're going to wrap that up there. I hope you enjoyed the show. You know a little bit more about Jack. We'll see the show tonight. Tomorrow we'll talk Spider-Man, get you primed and ready for the movie, which comes out this weekend. And then on Thursday we'll talk about Hawkeye, and then i got to figure out next week's shows. So we'll have the finale of Hawkeye, hopefully a uh, spoiler discussion about Spider-Man, and I got to figure out what to do for Thursday as I'm supposed to be out of town by then. So we'll figure it out. Hope you all have a great night. Uh, we'll be back at five o'clock. Stick around for Black Comic Universe, Minute to Skim It, and then we'll be back for in stores this week. Good night, everybody.